Hello and welcome to GMBN Tech. It's your weekly Ask show. But I've had so many questions about Coil that I thought I'd make a special episode just on Coil. And what better place to do it than with Tim from Fox UK Service Centre. And I'm going to ask him all the questions. Are you ready for this, Tim? I'm ready, yep. Cool. So I'm going to start you off with an easy one here. Okay. I've had Toffee Dan on social media who says, why orange? What, what's that all about for Fox? Well, <laughs> simple. It just looks cool. <laughs> I need to go elaborate yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've just had my Fox uh, forks, my 38 serviced, and I even got some orange dials on there just yeah. because I've had the pro tune. So uh, yeah. I no. can confirm it looks cool. Um, also, I've got a question here. Um, and I think this is a common question from John Cox, Sports Therapy, who says, for the average trail rider, is the difference between coil and air worth it? Yeah. Um, not a straightforward question to answer. Probably not, uh, but it really comes down to, there's a lot of variables in it. So is the bike designed around a coil shock or an air shock? That's an important one to start with. There's... The kind, I'm guessing the question's kind of been asked in, you know, the perception that the coil is better. Yeah. It's not necessarily the case. It really depends on the application. Um, like say if a bike is designed around an air shock, a coil shock isn't necessarily going to give any performance advantage at all. In fact, it'd probably be, a, you know, a sort of downgrade in performance. So, yeah, it's quite a tricky one to say. Yeah, they would notice a difference, but whether that difference is better or not, there's a lot of factors in that as, uh, to sure. kind of consider. I wonder if people think it's better because they see it on downhill bikes, so they think, well, the pros are running them, it yeah. must be better, but really they're using it for a very different application to what most of it's us quite trail quite specific riders usually, are. so yeah, exactly. People will see a pro rider on a coil shock and think, oh, that's what I need to make myself go faster or the bike feel better, but they have to consider that that bike is been quite carefully thought out to work around that shock. So just simply putting that shock onto any bike doesn't necessarily give the same same performance. No, so not better, but just different. Just maybe different. Horses and to courses, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, so maybe that explains the next question, is why do we see so many air shocks on bikes, but not so many coil forks uh, or shocks? Are you talking about forks rather than... Um, I guess both really, because we do see air on the rear pretty much yeah. you know, 95% of the time yeah. in majority of bikes, not coil rear. So yeah. why do you think that is? Um, well, air is much more straightforward to set up. Well, in terms of if you need a different spring on a coil shock, obviously you have to get buy a completely different part and fit it. And there is a bit of trial and error in that. Sometimes there are sort of formulas to work out and which are usually pretty accurate however if you want to tailor it slightly you mean creating a whole new spring air shocks you can change the change the spring rate just by simply attaching the shock pump you can also change the spring uh, progression by changing volume spaces all of which can be done by a home mechanic and once they're on a pump it can be done for free once you know, that initial pump's been bought whereas a coil shock you know is a lot more involved changing so for a bike manufacturer selling thousands of bikes um air shocks and yeah, ear shocks are much easier and dealers prefer it for that reason as well. So, so, sure, overall, so straight out of the box, then yeah. they can set it up for themselves yeah. at home. Whereas with Absolutely. coil, you've got to go and buy some more parts and buy set different it up springs. And the springs, and you know, they are relatively expensive. So yeah, there's a big, big advantage. Here. And also, they a lot ear shocks are lighter. Um, so that, and with the progress made in spring ear spring technology over the last sort of two decades. The, the difference in sort of seal stiction, which was always an issue with air shocks in the early days, is almost negligible now. So, mm. yeah, they're cool. And we don't see many um, coil forks mm. these days either. Do you think there's a reason for that? Are people preferring the main air reason? Forks? It's probably the biggest reason I would say a forks forks were on a one to one mm. ratio, whereas a, a frame will have. Uh, leverage ratio we built into it. So with an air spring on a fork, it's much harder to build a progression into the air sp into a coils fork than on a, the rear of the bike. So for that reason, an air spring just it gives so much more opportunity for setting the fork up correctly, performance of the fork, and doesn't really offer any of the advantages you gain from the feel of a coils spring in a fork. 
uh, negligible compared to the negatives of having that linear springs, which then you lose the support, which the riders rely on to sort of force right, and pushing sure. the front tyre into the ground and the feel and the feedback in that respect. Mm, of course, and also straight out of the box, you can set it up pretty same, much Same perfectly. as the rear shock, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so obviously pulling out um, an air shock is easier to sort of adjust straight out of the box, yeah. but um, what about servicing over time? I've got a question here. Is it easier to service a coil over time? Does it need less maintenance? Is there any benefits in that way? No, it's all the same maintenance right. uh, periods as a air shock would, and all I'd say on that really, they both require the sort of knowledge of a sort of skilled suspension technician to be rebuilt properly, so. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, I've got a question here from Porter McMichael. Is there a performance compromise by going with an SLS coil over a standard coil? So he's talking about the light springs here, isn't he? Yes, that's correct. So, I mean, the SLS springs really are just about saving weight. So super light steel, the SLS stands for. So it's just a lighter way of using a coil spring over a, a sort of standard steel coil spring if you want to call it that so just about weight saving optimizing performance you know as yeah, it's a human powered vehicle in their bicycle so yeah, if it's lighter sure. power to weight ratios increase it's marginal admittedly but you know if it's looking for marginal gains then yeah and they come in orange as it says yeah. Said, it's cool. yeah yeah i've got that on my rallon and it does look pretty good but um so do you think it feels any different being on a lighter spring to on the standard um, theoretically it should be should feel different, but you're not going to feel it in reality. Too little a difference. It is very marginal, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so I've got this suspension doctor here who says, how do they decide on an OEM tune for bikes? Do you measure anything on the bike? So this is a standard factory tune on, say, yeah. a Fox Shock in a particular yeah. model. How do you think they decide um, so what they the, get? Yeah, the product manager or the bike designer would usually work with the Fox OEM team who have a whole range of tunes then that can, they can kind of cross-reference with the bike design, the kinematics of the frame, etc. They'll have rider feedback as well for those brands, uh, whether it be racers or just um, sort of people who work in the company. So yeah, there's a lot of work, homework goes into those valves. And if Fox, if, if there's something outside of what they already have, then they'll build like a sort of ground up solution just for that that application. So yeah, I mean, Fox work very closely with the bike manufacturers to make sure those those tunes are appropriate and, and the best you can get for them really. And that specific tune, is that just the sort of um, light, medium, hard kind of damping tuning in the um, compression and the rebound? Or is there a little bit more to it than um, that? that? Those are certainly the main aspects, yeah, compression and rebound, but then there'll be things like volume spacer sizes in the air shocks, uh, maybe call spring rates, although obviously with that, without knowing the end user, the rider weight, then yeah. you can have to kind of make a best guess on that. But that's, again, that's gone back to the air shock being advantageous in that respect, because then it can be tailored quite quickly. So yeah, there's this consideration taken into into the field and then like the travel of the bike type of sort of um, application for it, a downhill bike versus a trail bike or an XC bike, for example. So yeah. Cool. cool. All right. Um, moving on. Well, we've got Chris Barker's asked, is coil better than air for downhill? So that's kind of almost what we've answered before about it being horses for courses. Yeah, absolutely. But would you see coil as more of a downhill thing? Yeah, um, because, and the other thing to consider, downhill bikes are still generally designed around coil shocks. Um, right. And so, yeah, for that application, that's why you still see sort of top level wheel cup riders choosing coil over air. Generally, not all, and there are some sort of high profile cases of people winning wheel cups on air shocks. So. Horses sure. for courses again, you know, it's rider preference, some like the feel of the, the, the progression of an air shock, some just mm. like the suppleness of a coil shock, the grip they get from that. Um, so yeah, it really comes down to a combination of the bike and design, but downhill is, is where you generally see more people running coil than, than any other sort of discipline of mountain biking. Yeah, sure. Of course, um, Canyon, they go for air, but that's more because the sender... Yeah. Uh, when Canyon sell direct, they have to give it to a person who needs yeah. to tune it for themselves. So air is obviously more tunable, um, but it's interesting. Yeah, you're right. 
yeah. there's majority of downhill bikes are still coil. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Is it the way they're riding or the fact that they're just focusing so much on downhill that it's better yeah. for I mean, that application? I mean, those, those riders are you know, winning and losing races by tenths of a second. So, you know, they marginal gains really is, you know, what they're looking for there and they feel they're getting that gain from the suppleness of a car truck, the grip and the feedback yeah. they get from that, then that's what they'll go for, you know, and those, you know, they're riding for short periods of time, at very high intensity. So, you know, that's really where those those gains or, or losses are perhaps, you know, are are sort of um, coming from. So Yeah, for yeah. sure. But, you know, as I said, it's been high profile riders winning on air shocks, not I mean Aaron Quinn won, you know, how many World Cup titles oh, on right. an air shock. So you know, just shows if the ride prefers it and it works for them, then yeah, it's not what is, say, not necessarily one is better than the other. For sure. Okay, so um, what do you get? So I've got Sean Carver 6 here. Um, what do you get in a custom tune and would the average mountain biker notice the difference? Okay, so custom tune, I'd probably call it op optimizing rather than customizing because you can custom tune anything all day long but whether <laughs> actually is needed or better yeah. that's, that's debatable so just because something's custom yeah it doesn't necessarily mean you know it means to improve it so potentially yes it depends where it, it's as I said from the OEM side of things they are generally very close to being you know spot on already so each end of the sort of rider weight spectrum, potentially there's gains to be made if the rider's very heavy or very light and the tunes of that the manufacturers spec on those bikes, obviously they don't know the end rider weight, so if something's very heavy, then yeah, you can potentially improve things there. Um, or I believe the ride's very light. So yeah, the, the, so really it's not, yeah, you can, yeah, I get Make you. A, difference, a custom but... tune, and this sort of highlight that a custom tune, or sometimes called a pro tune, or yeah. it's basically a tune that can um, sort of make it easier for lighter riders, I guess, to, to sort of dumb it yeah, down. Yeah, again, that's just And make it a bit more supportive for heavier, heavier riders. riders. Yeah. But if you're the average rider, you probably wouldn't need that at yeah. all. I mean, on um, something like a, an X2 float or air shock or coil shock, you've got such a wide range of adjustment, for compression and rebound, low and high speed. I generally say if you're not pushing those at the maximum either end of the adjustment on those obviously firmer for a he and slower for a heavy rider and, and open and lighter for a lighter rider if you're not at those extremes then you probably don't need to be looking at custom stuff because you've got what you need in that adjustment range mm. um, i mean the other thing to add in there is quite often you get asked about custom tunes people forget just basic maintenance it makes a massive difference so i've heard people say oh, i've had my shock custom tuned or my fork custom tuned after a year's use Really, right. at that point, you probably just needed the service to make your product right. feel good again. So you've not only have you had it custom tuned, you've also had it service at the same time. So a large part of that improvement you're feeling today was probably just because it's serviced and it's fresh again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not worth forgetting that. Um, yeah, you know, I think people main... forget like how good a fork can feel when it's just been serviced. Yeah. It'll feel like yeah. it's just come out the box again. Exactly. Because obviously the oil dries up or it gets contaminated yeah. and your fork just doesn't feel as plush anymore, does it? Yeah. So And and I mean yeah. going back to the whole coil A sort of question theme, that people have the coil idea because it's suppler, because you've got um you know, less seals on it than an air shock, but you no, know, that suppleness on air products, arguably you're losing that every time you wash your bike, you ride it, that's yeah, you know, a little bit of degradation each time, especially in winter conditions in the UK. Yeah. So, you know, over a period of time, you've, you've not got the same performance you did in the beginning. And that's why maintenance and service, it, you know, the bike's taking a hammer in on the, in the winter mm. so in particular. So you really need to kind of keep on top of that if, if you're looking for those performance gains or just, yeah. Would you get less degradation on a, on a coil then, than an air? Um, so it's potentially because you only have one main seal exposed to the world that's a lot smaller than the air shock. Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, it's, it's negligible, really. Right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So who else have we got? Um, uh, Andy Nelson says here: uh, Will Fox bring out a progressive version of the SLS Spring? Not that I know of. No. No. 
Okay. I think they would have done it already for 20 years or plus of making <laughs> springs. But. Do you think there's just no call or not enough call for people? So basically coil is very linear in the yeah. way that it rides, but you can buy progressive coils that have more of a ramp up. Is that right? Yes. Um, and he's asking, why aren't you doing that in the light version? Just um, not enough call for it, do you I think? I guess so, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it would have, I have the opinion, it would have made one already if they thought it was worthwhile, so. Okay, cool. Um, so, I've got a, another random question here. Um, why is there no XC type of coil shocks? Interesting question. Yeah, I think yeah. there's probably a couple of answers and, to that well, one. The easy answer for me is XC rides are all about lightweight. Coil yeah. springs are heavier than air shocks. It's not, not worth making them for that reason. And that's the yeah. first thing I thought. Yeah. I wonder if um, air is usually considered more playful and poppy. I wonder if an XC rider wants that sort of energy transfer more and maybe a coil would sort of absorb too much energy for a typical... Yeah, you know. potentially. I think it weight would be the main reason. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, mm. You know, it's only really just got their heads around running dropper posts on XC bikes. Right. <laughs> so, you know, sticking a coil yeah. spring on and there. There's still yeah. some people resisting that one yeah. for sure. Um, so this one, I haven't got a name for who asked, but I think the, it's a question on everyone's lips when they first yeah. start or they're starting to look at coil. How do I know what coil I need? And that's a big question, but it can be yeah. quite confusing. Yeah. So, so if you've, say we've got um, a coil shock on the bike already, we've bought it like that. Yeah. How would I know what coil I need for my particular weight, I guess, is a good place yeah, to start. Yeah, a couple of ways of approaching it. I mean, the, a lot of the bike manufacturers that spec coil shocks now will have a weight chart on their, in their manuals, which is usually on their websites these days. So weigh yourself with all your riding gear on, look at the chart, and then it'll give you a, a suitable coil spring rate. Um, you can just do a, a sag check as well, with, maybe get some of the help you set on the bikes, all, all in the, the owners of the manuals. Um, see if that's you're getting the correct amount of sag for the range and the type of feel you're looking for. And then beyond that, if you want to invest in a new spring and you really want to make sure you're spending the money on the correct one, Fox have um, a coal spring guide on their tech help section on their website available to all consumers. Um, yeah, and you put your, your information into there, your rider weight, your bike travel, and it'll run a little calculation and give you uh, the nearest spring rate. Cool. Um, so I think we'll try and leave a link in the description below to the uh, calculator. Yeah. But as a quick guide, I guess people can measure the eyelets and then a bit extended, then sit on the bike and exactly, measure yeah. the, the, the difference that's missing. Yeah. And that's work out the percentage. Percentage of sag, yeah. yeah. Which is all, it says, all clearly explained in the owner's manual, step by step. Fox are pretty, um, pretty good at that and mm. giving you the detail of how to make sure you're doing it right. And yeah, that's... That's, yeah. that, that, that is the most accurate way, ultimately. Calculators will get you get you close, but getting on the bike, I mean, the calculator doesn't take into account uh, the position you sat on the bike, although most people are on frames with very similar geometry these days. There are variances and some sort of extremes out there, so yeah. Cool, and I've just got one other question. I haven't got a name for this, but actually this question came up a couple of times. Okay. Does the placement of a shock matter? So. They're asking, does it matter whether it's up here or down here? Does it matter whether it's the other way around? Um, okay. Does is the placement of the shock in uh, frame design it make any difference? Not to the shock. The shocks are pressurized, so whichever position they are on the bike, it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, in terms of a bike design, where it goes, that's probably more of a bike designer question around the, <laughs> yeah. the linkages and whatever, the, yeah. you know, the sort of principle they're working to, if you like, but um, or concept they're working on. But yeah, I mean, the shock itself, it doesn't matter. Great. Okay. Um, well, I think that's that pretty much sums up the majority of our questions. But if you guys have got any more questions related to suspension or particular coil, then you can put your comments down in the comments below and use hashtag AskGMBNTech so that we can find your questions and maybe we'll put them in a future show as we're starting to do these weekly now on a Monday. So do join in the debate below in the comments and hopefully I'll see you in future. See you later guys. <laughs>